All right, welcome back, y'all. We're going to be in Genesis 40 for this session, Genesis chapter 40 and verses 1 to 23. And again, before we hear God's word, let's pray together. Lord, once again, be gracious to us and feed us with the bread from heaven, even Jesus our Lord, through the word of life, we pray for your glory in Jesus' name, amen. Genesis 40, beginning at verse 1, this is God's inspired and therefore an errant word. Sometime after this, the cupbearer of the king of Egypt and his baker committed an offense against their lord, the king of Egypt. And Pharaoh was angry with his two officers, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker, and he put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard in the prison where Joseph was confined. The captain of the guard appointed Joseph to be with them, and he attended them. They continued for some time in custody, and one night they both dreamed. The cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt who were confined in the prison, each his own dream, and each dream with its own interpretation. When Joseph came to them in the morning, he saw that they were troubled. So he asked Pharaoh's officers who were with him in custody in his master's house, Why are your faces downcast today? They said to him, We have had dreams, and there is no one to interpret them. And Joseph said to them, Do not interpretations belong to God? Please, tell them to me. So the chief cupbearer told his dream to Joseph and said to him, In my dream there was a vine before me, and on that vine there were three branches. And as soon as it budded, its its blossoms shot forth, and the clusters ripened into grapes. Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup and placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. Then Joseph said to him, This is its interpretation. The three branches are three days. In three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your office, and you shall place Pharaoh's cup in his hand as formerly when you were his cup bearer. Only remember me when it is well with you, and please do me the kindness to mention me to Pharaoh, and so get me out of this house. For I was indeed stolen out of the land of the Hebrews, and here also I have done nothing that they should put me into the pit. When the chief baker saw that the interpretation was favorable, he said to Joseph, I also had a dream, and there were three cake baskets on my head, and in the uppermost basket there were all sorts of baked food for Pharaoh, but the birds were eating it out of the basket on my head. And Joseph answered and said, this is its interpretation, the three baskets are three days. In three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head from you and hang you on a tree, and the birds will eat the flesh from you. On the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, he made a feast for all his servants and lifted up the head of the chief cupbearer and the head of the chief baker among his servants. He restored the chief cupbearer to his position, and he placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand, but he hanged the chief baker as Joseph had interpreted to them. Yet, the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. Thus ends the reading of God's word. May he add his blessing to it. So as we come to this part of Joseph's story, we've skipped ahead in the narrative um, probably about a decade. If you read Genesis 38, the story of Judah and Tamar, that gives you a kind of an aside that Moses gives us there of about 20 to 23 years is what the the scope of Genesis 38 is. It's an interlude, and then you pick it up here, and we're working chronologically so that by the time we get to Genesis 41, um, Joseph's been in Egypt probably about 20 years, okay? And at this point, we're looking like, you know, 10 to 13 Three of them have been spent in prison by this point, okay? Now think about this. If you remember the story, if you haven't read it, here's what happens. Joseph goes out to his brothers at the latter part of 37. He says, um, hey, dad needs you. 
And they're like, hey, we're going to sell you into slavery. First, we're going to try to kill you. Then we'll have a better idea to make some money instead of killing you. So they send him into slavery. He goes down to Egypt. He gets bought by the most, second most important guy in the world. He gets brought to his house, Potiphar. Potiphar's wife is an adulteress. She casts eyes on Joseph. And then she lies about him, and he finds himself in prison. Uh, he's been there probably about three years now when we meet him in this prison. And as I was thinking about this, um, my wife and I were just talking, we were meeting some other folks here who are nurse practitioners, that's what she does, and when she was in grad school, I just remember, she would just like tell me, hey, sweetie, look at what God does in our bodies, aren't they incredible? Like, and you stop and think about it, it's one of the ways God reveals himself to us is the way he designed our bodies. And here's some interesting things about our bodies. We can survive for just two to three minutes without air, unless you're trained in, the, I think the world record's 11 minutes holding your breath. Um, I'm pretty sure my littlest, my youngest was getting ready to cry. She could hold it for like probably around that time before she let it out. So maybe I challenge that world record. Um, and we can survive just 10 minutes, humans can, at 300 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, we can endure 30 minutes of exposure to 40 degree water. And we can survive up to seven days without water. That's very unusual. Most it's about three. And only about 45 days without food. So our bodies are amazing, but they're limited, and we can stretch them to the breaking point. And that's the same way with our faith. That's why I wanted to use that illustration here, because Joseph's faith would have been immensely tested by this point. Because he gets those dreams in Genesis 37, and then it's like God goes radio silent on him. And he knew what had happened. He knew God had met with him. And now he's in this prison. And that last verse, verse 23, he's forgotten again. And how easy it would have been for Joseph to give up on God, even before this. Hey, God, you gave me these dreams, and then I was sold into slavery, lied about, falsely accused, imprisoned. How does he keep going, and how does it teach us to keep going? And here's what I want us to see. When, when hope seems dead, faith serves, faith trusts God's sovereignty, and faith hopes in God's providence. So that's what happens when you feel like there's no hope. Joseph gives us this roadmap here. It, it serves. Faith serves. Faith trusts God's sovereignty, and faith hopes in God's providence. And those will be our points here from this text. And as one commentator put it, when we get to this part of Joseph's story, it's about the same old suffering that continues on long after we think it should be over. Okay, so he's still in prison, and maybe that feels like something in your life. Like, when's this trial going to be over? It feels like it should be over, have been over a long time ago. Why do I keep going through this? Why doesn't God just take away this trial? That's where we're going to lean into this morning. So first of all, faith serves in verses 6 and 7. Here's what happens when we suffer most of the time. When we suffer physically, emotionally, spiritually, it makes us myopic, okay, and it makes us selfish, right? Because most of the time when we suffer, we are just concentrating on the pain stopping. That's not a bad thing, okay? You, uh, you know, you bump your elbow really hard into something and it starts to bruise, you want to get pain relief. That's not a bad thing. But I'm talking about the long-term suffering, whether physical, spiritual, or emotional. It can, be, it can begin to make us selfish. And notice what happens with Joseph here right at the outset. We notice that he's already begun to change by God's grace. Okay, so when we met him, he's this arrogant, entitled teenager. Now he's in his, let's call it late 20s or so, and he's, he's a guy who's been rotting in a prison, as it were, and he's looking for opportunities to serve. Okay, so he's listening to these guys talk about their dreams, and what could he have done? He could have been like, dreams? Let me tell you what happens when you dream. You end up here. He doesn't do that. He's looking for opportunities to serve. Instead of, self, instead of suffering making him selfish, it made him more God-centered. Okay? And that's uh, one of our pastors in Chattanooga likes to say it like this. You know, if we, if we run from the school of suffering that God puts us in, 
He will re-enroll us. <laughs> he will re-enroll us until we learn that lesson. And Joseph didn't need that re-enrollment. It's making him more God-centered. He's paying attention to the distress of those around him. And that reminds us that, that suffering, my friends, your personal allotted suffering that God has entrusted to you and to me, those personal hardships, those difficulties, they become a form of evangelism in our lives. Okay? We all know when you talk to anybody, whether they're a Christian or not a Christian, everybody's hurting. Everybody's got just bad stuff going on. And people are looking for anything for relief. And when we can begin to hold on to the Lord, to hold on to Jesus when suffering is getting after us and tearing up our own hearts and it makes us more God-centered like it did for Joseph, that is, a, that is going to be incredibly powerful in terms of witness to people. That this gospel is real, that it makes a difference, that it will change us as we follow Jesus our difficult providences are meant to make us more like Jesus so that we can make more followers of Jesus, okay? That's one of the things God's entrusting our suffering with us for. It's meant to make us more like Jesus to make more followers of Jesus. That was Joseph's mindset. Now, think about his mindset for a second. We've said it's, it's not selfish, it's God-centered, Every day he's sitting in this prison, there's no prospect of, of freedom. There's no justice system here. There's no appeal court. There's nothing like that. He's sitting there, no prospect for freedom. He's been falsely accused of rape by one of the most powerful women in this country. And he felt like his dreams were the stuff of archaeology by this point. You know, that's something they're going to dig up later. They're, they're, they're dead and buried. And yet... Notice what he does. I think most of us would complain, turn bitter. Isn't that what happens when we don't get our way? Or when life doesn't go according to our plan? Isn't it so easy to just grumble and complain and get bitter? And Joseph doesn't do that. He becomes the kind of person I think all of us want to be when hardship strikes. And that's calm, steady, trusting the Lord, continuing on in joy. And, and we have to ask ourselves, how do we become those kind of people? How did Joseph become that kind of person? He didn't waste his suffering, friends. He didn't let it become something to, that made him bitter and angry and complaining. He's begun to learn to trust the Lord in the middle of the circumstances that he never asked for. So we have to, if we're following Jesus here, we have to take the temptation of selfish suffering and turn it into God-centered joy. And that God-centered joy works for the good of others. That's one of the reasons we're giving, given the stewardship of suffering in our lives. Is, is God saying to us, I I'm going to use this in a way that, that you don't even fathom right now. But you have to trust me. So faith serves, but then faith faith trusts God's sovereignty there in verse 8. Now, notice the irony here. The dreams are what Joseph got, got Joseph into this trouble, and dreams are what's going to get him out of prison. They got him there, and they're going to get him out. And so the temptation now for Joseph at this point would be to be cynical. And as one author put it, cynicism seems so natural today <clears throat> because of the failure of the promises of liberalism. And I mean liberalism in a broad sense, not like just the political party sense, but this dream of you know, rationalistic, humanistic, enlightenment thinking that mankind can solve all of his problems and man is the measure of all things. And we all know that's just a failure. And there were so many promises from that that have not been kept that people become cynical. And what's the cynic's posture? What is, what's the cynical attitude we see around us today? Um, just notice now how, how a movie will get absolutely defamed if it's got a happy ending, okay? And, and Hollywood still hasn't learned the lesson, have they, right? Because you look at what happened with Top Gun Maverick, okay? Just a basic movie, action, happy ending. It blew the box office apart, okay? Because people are desperate to know, hey, 
And we're built this way, I think, by God to have stories that are not cynical. But you look at most TV shows, you listen to most songs, everything's cynical now because dreams are dead. And, and our society is cynical, saying, you know what, I'm not going to get fooled by that. And it's this posture of being aloof. And if that's your posture about religion, about Christianity, then, then Jesus is not ever going to make any sense to you. And what we have to realize is the self-defeating nature of cynicism. It postures itself as knowing better than like everybody else, so I'm not going to get fooled by that. Except it's being fooled by a worldview that's dying. That's the self-defeating nature of it. We all know the promises that led to cynicism don't work, and yet people are still trying them. People are still saying, no, I, I can do this life on my own. And notice what Joseph doesn't do here. He does not become a cynic. And, and here's the reason why, I think. Most of us become cynical when our dreams die. And that's kind of the, uh, the trajectory that a lot of people see their life on. Like, I had all these dreams when I was a kid. Uh, I thought about all these great things I was going to do. Now they haven't come to pass. And what do I do with my life? And God probably doesn't love me. And it's not worth going on. And these kind of things. And, and what does Joseph do instead? His dreams were never about him. Okay? That's one of the things even early on he realized. Most of us become cynical and bitter because our dreams are about us. As one author put it, who fantasizes about people saying no to them? Right? I mean, when you think about like your world and your daydreams, everybody does what you want them to do. And we become little sovereigns in our, in our dreams. And that's not what happened to Joseph. That's why I think he's not cynical here. He, he understands that the desire to be a little sovereign and to build our tiny little kingdoms is always on a collision course with the true and living God who is building his kingdom, who is always sovereign, and who's always going to win. And so Joseph understands that, and he says, uh, he, he does what we don't do. He ditches any kind of false ideas about God. And then he says, this is the God I'm going to trust in. This is the only one who matters. And so as, as he's doing this, and he says to them, look there at verse 8. Let me turn back there here, my own translation. He says, we have had these dreams, and Joseph says, do not interpretations belong to God. See, as he serves, he trusts what God is going to do. Now, just think about that statement, friend. Do not interpretations belong to God? Why would he still be saying that? Wouldn't it be natural for him to go, no, they don't, and that's why I, you know, am here. But no, he gives God all the glory, and he's saying there's only one sovereign, only one God who can interpret these dreams for us. Now, this would have been shocking to these two officials, okay? In Egyptian religion at this time, plenty of texts and archaeology have been done on this, uh, interpreting dreams was a lucrative business, as one author put it. It was, it was very lucrative for them to know what to do. And so they're puzzled and confused, and they hear Joseph talking about this one God. And he sees an opportunity, does Joseph, to glorify God among people who don't know him. And, and using what his own stewarding of his suffering to bless these other people would at the same time show them who God really is. Now, the only way you get there, my friends, of having this calm, steady faith when trials come, is if you and I are grounded, as we mentioned in the last segment, in the absolute sovereignty of God. And it's so easy to, to grasp this doctrinally. And I, I teach systematic theology, so I love doctrine. Do not hear me like downplaying that at all. We should all love doctrine because everybody in here is living out some kind of doctrine. Okay, but... When it just is doctrinal and we can repeat it and we can argue about it, then God is going to test us to see if we really believe it. That he's absolutely sovereign. Um, 
working on a project right now and was reading a book by an, an open theist author. Open theism is the teaching that God is not absolutely sovereign, that um, in order for us to be fully human, I'm trying to give a nutshell here, there's a whole lot more to it, but in order to be fully human, uh, we have to have free will that can override God's sovereignty. So the title of the book that I was reading about God's sovereignty and suffering was called God Can't. And the thesis of that, that book is there's some things God can't do uh, because of his voluntary limitation to enable us to have more free will. And as I read through it, this guy gave these poignant examples of people who had just suffered horrible things. And he said, you know, if you were to tell them that God is sovereign, what did he say? I would never worship a God who is a monster like that. Okay? And that, that's a pretty common view. And I think the temptation would be if you believe in God's absolute sovereignty is to go, those silly people. <laughs> you know, but if you step back and think about it, it is easy to understand in one sense where this author is coming from. I think he's totally wrong. And as an aside, when I was reading through all these examples he gave of just horrible suffering that people had endured, um, I, I was thinking to myself, well, yeah, but I could also, over 20 years of ministry, tell you a lot of stories of people who've had terrible things happen that have continued to trust the Lord. And that's what he didn't give you, is the other side of the story there. And I thought it was pretty disingenuous of how he was writing. And all that to say, when we say we believe in the sovereignty of God, he is going to test that. Not because he, he's trying to like play with us or toy with us. It's because he knows to get us where he needs us to be, it, it's not only going to come through the easy parts of our lives. In fact, I would venture to say that most of us can resonate with the statement of John Piper who said, which one of us says, I have learned the most about God on the sunny days, right? Nobody says that. It's when things get really hard that we're going to learn what we really believe about God. And when you look at somebody who's suffered well and still following Jesus and still has joy, you can depend upon this, that person has drunk deeply from the wells of God's sovereignty, not simply at a level that is content to rest in, here is the truth, and that's it, and I'm going to leave it there, but somebody who's drunk it into their very marrow of their souls. And if you want that, and we want to be like that, here's the hardest prayer to pray. Lord, do whatever it takes to get me there. Do whatever it takes to give me that kind of faith and trust. So this God who Joseph says interpretations belong to is the sovereign God he's trusting in, and he uses this as a time of evangelism. So faith serves, faith trusts God's sovereignty, and then faith trusts God's providence, 14 and 15. Joseph embodies Philippians 4.11, doesn't he? I've learned in whatever circumstances I find myself to be content. That's what Paul said. Okay, can we all just agree that that's really hard to say? I mean, how many of us can truly say that with Paul? I've learned that whatever circumstances I find myself in, I have learned the secret of contentment. Imagine if you published a book with that title, The Secret of Contentment by Joseph. Okay? And, and, and the word got out, and it goes viral, and people go, oh, wow, here's the secret. I think they'd find it be pretty mundane. Here's what Joseph and Paul would say to us. The secret of learning this contentment is trusting this sovereign God in his providence. Joseph was content with his circumstances because he saw God's guiding hand over all of them. And what we want to avoid, as we've seen cynicism, but also fatalism, What's fatalism? Fatalism is the belief, you know, summarized by it, que sera, sera, whatever will be, will be. Fatalism is the view that our choices don't matter, we don't have any um, uh, real responsibility over our actions because after all, God is totally sovereign and he's preordained whatever comes to pass and therefore we are not responsible. And that's not at all what the Bible teaches, is it? And just one verse will illustrate that. I think the best verse to illustrate this um, tension of God's sovereignty and our responsibility, Acts 2.23, 
This Jesus of Nazareth, Peter says, well attested to you by signs and miracles done among you. And he was delivered over to you by the predestining, translating of the Gabe International Version here, the hand of God and his foreknowledge. You slew, you wicked men slew by your own hands. Okay, do you see what he's saying there? uh, Preordained, predestined counsel that God said Christ is going to die on the cross, and Peter emphasizes that, and then he says, you crucified him. And you can imagine some of Peter's audience may be going, well, which one is it, Peter? And Peter's saying to them, yes. That's the same thing we learn here from Joseph's life. He had learned this lesson. He had learned that God's providence didn't make him a cynic, and then didn't make him a fatalist. He is still going to say, hey, God brought these two guys into my life. Remember me when you get out of here. He's going to use this for an advantage to try to get out of that prison. He's not just saying, well, I should be content living in prison for the rest of my life. No, he says, God's sovereign, and he might just use these guys to get me out of this jail cell. And here's where it gets really interesting, I think. Um... Think about the the cup baker or the, uh, the the cup bearer and the baker. I mean, imagine if you're the baker, you get you hear the cup bearer get this really favorable interpretation, and you're thinking to yourself, Joseph's a bona fide bona fide expert. He's the guy. So you go to him, and he says, uh, "You're going to die in three days." Okay, so maybe you go, "Man, I'm, I don't think I like him too much." So all of it comes to pass, which by the way shows us that Joseph's a true prophet. That test is going to be there in Deuteronomy 12. Hasn't, Moses has already written that, but the people of Israel haven't read it yet. And so that's coming up. Here's a foreshadowing of that te- uh, test for a false prophet. Does what he say come to pass? Joseph does, and it does come to pass. But then you think about these two officers here, and they get released. These were men who had had a high position. They were some of the most important people in Pharaoh's court. They'd been in prison. Do you think they wanted to get out of there? Okay. Yes. And what do they do? They do what most of us think, I think, would do when we got out of a situation like that. They were so happy to be out of prison, they would have said anything to get out of there. And the first thing they do is forget what they said they were going to do. Remember, Joseph says, just remember me, and they're, they're, I'm sure after he gave this interpretation of the cupbearer, he was like, bro, I got you. As soon as I get into Pharaoh's court, matter of fact, as soon as I'm shaved and cleaned up, I'm going to get you out of here. You can count on me. And none of that happens. Joseph is forgotten by men, forgotten by God, left by himself in this prison. And so again, I think this story gives us the biblical story in miniature. Now, Hundreds of years after this, God's people waited, waited for a long time to be released from slavery. God's people waited for 400 years after Malachi's prophecy before God gave them another word that came to them in the gospel. And when we think about our own lives, we can depend upon the fact that God is going to have us wait And just think about how many times you see that in the Bible. Wait on the Lord. And and one of the hardest things about waiting that Joseph learned here, that we're going to have to learn, is that waiting is a whole lot easier when you know it's going to be over and you know the purpose for it. And God rarely gives us either one of those things in our lives, does he? No, he puts us in situations that will bewilder us, in order that we stop our wretched self-savior attitudes. Have you noticed that in your heart? And this is so hard for us in America not to do. Because everything around us is like, hey man, you find yourself in a bad position, you do whatever it takes to get out of it. You pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. And God is going to break that attitude in us, friends. And when he brings us to a place of waiting, he rarely tells us when it's going to be over, and he rarely shows us what why we're there. Instead, he's saying, when the lights go out, will you still hold my hand even when you don't see where I'm leading you? That's what Joseph learned. He learned that his father's hand was strong enough to guide him 
even in the times of waiting. Now, why is this like the biblical story in miniature? Think about, just think about for a second, Jesus' life. Uh, we were at this great used bookstore in Chattanooga called McKay's. It's like 10,000 square feet of used books and records. So it's a happy place. And uh, we took our girls there, and I, went, I always go to the religion section, and there was a book by a, a scholar about why Jesus actually wasn't crucified and all the typical kind of conspiracy theory stuff. And I was thumbing through it, and he had all these neat pictures, and most of them were absolutely non sequiturs to his argument, but they were cool pictures. And reading through it, you know, Jesus, his hypothesis was Jesus was in Egypt and learning all these things and to do tricks and miracles, and that's why the Gospels aren't true, blah, 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 blah. Why do people write books like that? Or, you know, you, you all, some of you all may remember the Da Vinci Code, okay, that kind of thing, these conspiracy theories, the Passover plot, all of these things. Why do people write books like that? Because the truth is far too mundane for them. They think about somebody like Jesus who has shaped world history, and they go, there's got to be more to it. And the gospel accounts are pretty simple, aren't they? It tells us that Jesus, Jesus worked with his hands. And, and we think, like, the way we write modern biographies, uh, I'm just finishing a biography of Samuel Adams, who, by the way, was an amazing figure in American history and a good Presbyterian, so there's that. Um, that's a freebie. Um, so... Reading that, and, and what do you do when you read a modern biography? You, you pick it up and you expect, like, minute details. And this, was, this scholar had won a Pulitzer who's writing on Samuel Adams, and she's going through, like, here's what happened on December 28th, 1752 in Samuel Adams' life. And we map that onto the Gospels and go, where was Jesus for 30 years? And that's what scholars do as well. They're like, this can't be all there is to it. But Ancient biography is not the same as modern biography, is it? And the, ancient, the authors here of the Gospels, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, why don't they pay a lot of attention to Jesus' early life? Because they want to tell you the story about what he did for you. And so they leave off some of those details. What they do give us is this. Jesus lived in obscurity with his earthly parents, Working, we often translate the word as a carpenter, probably means something more like a general contractor. That's what Joseph was. And so for 30 years, I want you to think about this. Jesus was a blue-collar worker, as it were. I don't like that term, really, because it, it makes a, a false distinction. My, my grandfather was an iron worker his whole life. Uh, never went to college, fought World War II, U.S. Marine, still one of my heroes. Um, and he, he always was building something. But one of the things you notice about people who work like that is I can remember my grandfather's hands, like calloused, and him picking on me. Uh, you weren't worthy of being called by your real name until you were 18 in his eyes, so I was always Greg. So he'd be like, there's Greg, boy didn't even know how to wield a hammer. So, um, you know, he'd say that to my mom, like, tell Greg to go get my, uh, my tools for me. So um, just remembering his hands and, like, the calluses, and he was a tough old Marine, but he loved me and my brothers fiercely. And being around that growing up, like, today people, people despise manual labor, and here's what I want to get us back to. Jesus did that. He he was not like a nice-smelling individual when you met him, okay? There's no indoor plumbing. It's the first century. That's why washing feet was such a big deal. If you walk around with no indoor plumbing, no sewage facilities, where do you think all that goes? And that's why people walked around, they get this stuff caked on their feet. This is a different world than ours. And Jesus was, for 30 years, can you imagine the, the one who knows and designed the structure of the molecules of the wood that he was sawing or hammering, still doing that? Still sawing away and hammering away. He knows in the mystery of the incarnation everything about wood, and yet he learned how to use a saw. I don't know how that works. But I've always wondered this, like after the resurrection, and Jesus' half-brothers becoming disciples, did they ever take people back to the houses he helped his dad build? 
You know, can you imagine what that would have been like? I mean, imagine if you were sitting around in ancient Israel and, and somebody goes, well, you know, our architect, you know, you're kind of talking about your new home and it's beautiful flat roof. And you could be the person who goes, yeah, well, God built my house, quite literally, okay? So I wondered about that, and I bring all of that up in service of saying, why do people write these books? Why, why is this so hard for us to grasp? Because for 30 years, Jesus waited. He waited. He lived a life of obscurity. God the Son, just like Joseph God the Son in these circumstances that do not look befitting for the king of the universe and the creator of all things become man. And he's content to labor and learn and live until God says to him, now is the time. And during those 30 years, Jesus experienced the full range of human emotions. He experienced the full range of of human temptation. He was never a sinner. He never sinned. And yet he's experienced all that. And his life pattern becomes ours as Christians. All of Jesus' waiting and preparation was to minister to others while he waited for his coming glory. And in union with him, his people, his church now, As one author put it, we're engaged in the waiting service of the church of Jesus. We're waiting for the return of Christ. We're serving while we do that. That's what Joseph did. That's what Jesus did. Waiting. To quote the great theologian Tom Petty, the waiting is the hardest part, isn't it? Right? Okay, that's that's where we are. That's where we live. We live in a time of waiting. And we will never wait well or use our suffering as a form of evangelism until we get to where Joseph was with Jesus. Because the scriptures tell us Joseph looked ahead, and we'll come to this in chapter 50, and he says to his descendants, take my bones with you. The author of Hebrews in Hebrews 11 records this, that Joseph saw the coming resurrection. He saw Jesus in shadows and in types, but saw him. And I think one of the reasons Joseph could wait is because when he felt seemingly abandoned, he knew there would come a day when the one from the tribes of Israel, he didn't know exactly when, or who that person would be, or which tribe he would come from at this point. But he could wait because he knew that that coming one would be abandoned when Joseph wasn't. Joseph was seemingly abandoned by God. God gives him the interpretations. He encourages his faith. Jesus really was abandoned. And when he's on the cross... The father turns his face away, as our hymn puts it. And and Jesus cries out, Psalm 22, 1, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And friends, that's the last time a psalm of lament is either referenced by direct or indirect um, implication in the entire New Testament. Think about that. Last time a psalm of lament is mentioned in the New Testament is when Jesus is on The cross. Why is that? Because Jesus is in our place being abandoned by God and simultaneously transforming all the laments of all of God's people throughout all the ages recorded in Scripture into a new song. He's put a new song in my mouth, the psalmist says, and Jesus' new song is this for us. I will be abandoned so that you never will be. I will lament Psalm 22, 1 in your place so that when you feel abandoned, you will know you never truly are abandoned because I took that upon myself. I experienced the the racking darkness. I experienced the loneliness for the first time ever of my father turning his face away for you so that you and I would never know that. And that's what Joseph saw by faith. While he waits, he trusts. While Jesus waits, he trusts. 
and in union with him while we wait, while we suffer, we trust and serve. Let me say a couple things and then we've got to finish up here. Um, what does all this mean for us today here in 2024? When the world forgets, God remembers you. Just as brothers had forgotten about him, we'll see that part of the story. Uh, you may feel just totally not seen. That's the way we put it today, right? I feel seen or I don't feel seen. I feel heard or I don't feel heard. You may feel like that, and here's the thing. One of the beautiful truths of the gospel is this, that God forgets your sins because of Jesus, but he always knows you. He always remembers you. He always sees all of us, doesn't he? And if you're a Christian, that should be one of the most comforting things in the world because it means that there's nobody in this room that does not matter. It means there's nobody in this room that God does not see and know down to the depths of our souls. And that should be an encouraging thing because God is interested passionately, as it were, about your day-to-day -day life. He knows everything he's ordained for you. What did David say? All my days were written in your book when there was as yet one of them. All the things that you're going to go through, the things I'm going to go through, all the suffering, all the waiting, all the mysterious, inexplicable, bewildering providences of God in our lives, he knows. And when the world may forget us or not know our name, God still knows us. He never abandons us. You may feel abandoned, not downplaying that. One of the things we have to do when we feel so alone and feel so distant from God is to realize he has not abandoned us because of what we've learned about Jesus on the cross. You've probably heard the expression, um, don't forget in the darkness what God showed you in the light. You know, what you're learning about God right now that's going to be the, the storehouse, as it were, when, when life's hard hits your life, when it comes to you. That's where, what Joseph had begun to learn is he knew this God who gave him the dreams hadn't given up on him. And that's what sustained our Savior through Gethsemane and onto the cross as he knew what his father was going to do. And how much more for us who live on the other side of the cross with the full revelation of the New Testament, knowing what God's going to do for us, what he's promised for us. Eye has not seen, ear has not heard, nor has entered into the mind of man the things that God has promised to those who love him. Isn't that what Paul tells us? Isn't that what we're to look for in faith? So how do we keep going when God seems absent? Here's one thing to consider. God is leaving you and me where we are if we're in a place that's of discomfort or pain or bewilderment. He's leaving us where we are to show us more about who he is. And you can't have the one without the other. He's got to keep you where you are till you and I get to know him as he is in the way he needs us to know him in order to use us the way he wants to use us. And so one of the ways we do that is by whenever the, the hard of life hits, coming back to the sovereignty that this was ordained. We don't freak out. We don't flip out. We don't flee. We don't fight. We say, God this was ordained. I don't understand. I know you hear me. I know you understand my pain. I know Jesus took your abandonment in my place for me. And we cry out to him that way. And then one of the hardest things to do is we're learning who God is, where he's leaving us, is accepting the trials he sends as an invitation to know Jesus better. So the moment that you and I pray and say, Lord, I want to get to know you better, it gets hard. So if anybody said to you that, um, I know this has not ever been a message in this church because I know your pastor is well enough, but you've, ever, you've heard it in popular preaching and teaching, you know, hey, come to Jesus and, and things are going to get better for you. You'll have this abundant life. That is true. That is true. I want to say that you get abundant life, but guess what Jesus told us with that abundant life? Houses, lands, fathers, brothers, and persecutions, he tells us. Suffering. 
You'll get all the, you're going to inherit the world, Paul says. You're going to inherit the, all of the earth belongs to the saints. That's what the, the Bible tells us. But in the meantime, until Jesus returns, all of it's going to be hard because this is a cursed world we live in. And when you feel abandoned by God, when you feel alone, it's that there and then when the trials are upon us that we have to see it's an invitation from God to say, if you really want to know my son, you've got to go where he went. You've got to follow in his footsteps. And his life pattern was suffering and then glory. Good Friday, then Easter Sunday. That life pattern is going to be the same for all who are in union with him. That means there's preordained hardness, hardship in all of our lives that God is going to use. And then the last thing, remember that God gets the glory when we suffer well in our disappointments. We never know what what God's going to use our witness for, do we? You may have a friend who who knows a little bit about your story. You may be in a hard place. And as you go on with the Lord, you don't know what God's going to use your suffering as a form of evangelism in that friend's life for. We don't understand. We can't see the whole picture. That's why it's so hard. And one of the things God at least is up to is saying, I will get the glory for my great name as I lead you through this time. I was thinking about the story of um, Hudson Taylor when I was preparing this. Um, Y'all may know him. He's the China Inland Mission, one of the great missionaries of the modern era, of any era. But what you may not know is after he started the China China Inland Mission, he was forced to return back to his sending, his place of origin, uh, East London, where he was sent from. Uh, He was poor at this time. He was sick. And his early supporters just seemed to be nowhere to be found. It's like, where are they? And he had to spend about five years there in East London, wondering what God was doing. He had this amazing start to this mission, and now he was stranded back in London. And thinking like, what are you doing, God? And here's what he said. Without those hidden years, with all their growth and testing, How could the vision and enthusiasm of youth have been matured for the leadership that was to be? Isn't that an amazing perspective by this this man so used greatly of God? He says, "I'm, I'm this youthful guy, had this enthusiasm, and I needed this time in order to prepare me for what was coming next. Or as a friend of mine put it to me recently, Show me a person who has not been to the desert, and I will show you a Christian who is a fraud. God brings us to the desert, to the wilderness, to the place of prison and waiting. He'll bring us to this obscurity like he did for Jesus and then for Hudson Taylor in order to form us into the people we need to be to be used by him. So as one commentator put it, Delay never thwarts God's purposes. It only polishes his instruments. That's what he's doing in our lives right now. The the delay, the waiting is not thwarting his purposes. It's polishing you and I into a bright, shiny weapon in the hand of the Almighty. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you did give us stories here in the Old Testament. We thank you for the great story of the gospel, of Jesus who loves us and gave himself for us. Father, teach us, oh teach us, Lord, what it means to wait. And in the waiting, which is so hard, let us look to you by faith, Lord Jesus. Help us, give us the faith that Joseph had, and even more so because we live on the other side of the cross. Let us see your gentleness will make us great. We pray in your mighty name. Amen. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks so much, Dr. Fleur.
We're going to have our longer morning break at this time, so we've got a couple things to remind you of. There are, again, there's lots of books left here. There's plenty of snacks and refreshments in the hallway, uh, but also if you have questions, we have question cards. We'll collect those throughout the day. We'll have a basket up front here, but grab a three by five card if you have a question. If you want to uh, dig in later, we'll have a moderated Q&A session and we get to pick Dr. Fleur's brain about these topics. So uh, enjoy, your, enjoy your break. We'll be back here at 11.15. Justice. Sad. 